I, I, I know that with the passing of Michael and stuff like that, is that a question that you've been getting a lot? Or? Well, yes, mm -hmm. but that's life. Okay. And to have been associated with somebody that great, you're going to get that until you die. Right. You don't die. That's like, you know, what was it like working with Elvis, you mm -hmm. know, or, you know, how do you feel about his passing, you know, great guy. Yeah. You know, the the, uh, the sad thing is everyone always asks me about Michael Jackson, but very few people ask me about Miles Davis. Huh. Really? Partially because they don't know or it doesn't have the same impact wow. on their life as, as Miles had on mine. Wow. You know. That is kind of heartbreaking. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, King of Pop, we sold 110 million records. Yeah. You know, Miles Davis, we didn't sell that many records back then. Miles Davis's first gold record was Bitches Boo. Well, that kind of floors me only because, like, I, I, I played in the jazz band, and, you know, that was, you know, reading about Miles. I got a couple of his documentaries, his autobiography, and so to see, hear his music and how it's actually changed it, it, it is, it is thing. yeah, that is, that is almost... Over the course of jazz, yeah. for five decades, here's a guy that shaped and had a major hand in five decades of jazz, American music. All right, so we are here with Mr. Ndugu Chancellor. Mr. Chancellor, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. It's indeed my pleasure. Uh, what is your story? What's your background and how did you fall in love with music? My background in music started in a small town in Louisiana called Shreveport, Louisiana. At age six, I started going in the backyard and making my own drums. I take oatmeal boxes or coffee cans, two branches. I didn't have any drumsticks. And I started beating on things washing dishes, I'd take the steak knives, and I'd beat. At age eight, my parents moved to California. We moved to California, and I went over to the elementary school band director, and I said, I'd like to play the drums. And the band director said, you have the lips and the arms to play trombone. And I said, lady, I do not want to play the trombone. I want to play the drums. She said, we don't have any room for any drummers. So I didn't play. In the elementary school talent show, I was Ringo Starr, playing air drums. You know, I played to the Beatles, because that was the beginning of the whole British invasion. So I was a Beatle. I had my Hulam priest suit and all of that, and I was a Beatle. But I still had not connected with the instrument. I got to junior high school, and I walked into the band room, and I told the band director, I said, I want to play the drums. He gave me a pair of sticks, a book, and a practice pad, and he said, take this and come back, and we'll see what's going on. And it changed my life. Now, prior to that point, I hadn't really been exposed to any musicians or any real music, per se, uh, because radio back then was just general radio. You heard everything. You heard Ray Charles, Johnny Mathis, Perry Como, Sammy Davis, and you heard everyone on the same radio station. It wasn't black radio, white radio, jazz, blah, blah, it was just radio. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what being genre specific was. I just knew I liked music after I started hearing music. And then I played a drum and that turned my whole life around because originally I was going to school uh, for computer programming. My band director took me to a jazz festival at age 13 and that was the confirmation. And I saw some of not only the greatest drummers, but I saw a few people, one whom would end up being one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Dick Super, who played with the Jazz Crusaders. And my hero, who to this day is one of my most loved drummers, a guy by the name of Jack DeChanette. Mm -hmm. I saw all these drummers in the same evening, along with Buddy Rich. So that's what really started me to being interested in the music. Often when you're interviewed, a lot of times you're not really asked about Miles and um, working with him. Um, why do you think that is? 
During the period that I was working with Miles Davis, Miles Davis had fell out of favor with jazz critics and the traditional jazz fan. Uh, during the time that I was with Miles Davis, Miles Davis was actually innovating the next wave of jazz, smooth jazz, commercial music, and fusion. Miles Davis did a number of innovative things that are still prevalent in the music today. Multiple keyboards, multiple guitars, ethnic percussion from different backgrounds other than Afro-Cuban. All of those things are now viable parts of not only jazz, but pop music, R&B music, Afro-Cuban music, mm -hmm. all the genres, country music, everything stems from that. You listen to a smooth jazz band today, and they have two keyboard players. Uh, you listen to R&B bands, and they have two and three guitar players. You know, so all these were trends along with the incorporation of electronic synthesizers other electronic instruments were all part of that. So when I was with Miles Davis, being that he had come from a heavy traditional jazz background, they wanted to keep him in that mold. Mm -hmm. And our band was one of the revolutionary bands, the bands that kind of broke new ground, that would only start to gain notoriety years later, mm -hmm. after the era. Now they're going back researching the era and discovering all of these gems, jewels, and all of this hidden information and hidden music on that period. Because that whole fusion era was a mystery period for jazz. So people did not pay the attention to the Miles Davis bands of that period as they did the quintessential band with Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter. Tony Williams.